So we're lucky enough to live in Chicago. We have this beautiful city, the city that people travel to from all over the world. They come to see the architecture. They come to go to our extraordinary plays. They come to use our parks. This is a city that is considered to be one of the best designed cities in the world. Thank you. And the question is, first, how did it get that way? And second, what do you do in the 21st century to build on it? How do you do a new design of a city that's already great and get it to be relevant in a brand new way to set up another century of advance in this region in a way that people will come to respect? That's the question we're going to ask in the next couple of minutes, OK? And first, let's respect the progress that we've made and answer the question where it came from. It came because of a calamity. Very often, designers will tell you this, what happens after a calamity is people learn to make something fabulous. We had that extraordinary fire in 1871, and then a brilliant designer, architect and thought leader, Daniel Burnham gave us that famous plan of Chicago in 1909. It took that long, from 1871 to 1909, to think it up, to figure out what you would do with a city that was utterly devastated, just wiped out. And what he built was a plan that was exceptional. Several ideas that to this day are actually newsworthy. 29 miles of lakefront, by law, always made available to every citizen in the region. Not you know, sort of broken up into gated communities only reserved for wealthy people. Infrastructure that's designed, as you heard already, in a way that's remarkable. Some of the best experiments ever in fiber optic cables have been done here. The idea of parks everywhere designed for citizens and designed for families and designed in ways that are really remarkable. And of course, the access to a lake, an extraordinary lake, and the resources of fresh water that we've been learning about. So we already have a great city, but as you know, like every other city in modern life, it has its problems and it has its challenges. We have these strengths that we talk about. People don't know this, even people that live in Chicago. It's the greatest place in the world to start a, grand new, a great new restaurant. It's the greatest place in the world to create an extraordinary new play. Those are some of our strengths, but we also have considerable challenges not the least of which is a political climate that could most charitably described as weird. <laughs> so let's talk about what we would do now to create a game-changing plan when we already have such a foundation. What do you do next? That's a really interesting thing to think about. Now, most of us are frustrated with politics, but to a very large extent amazed by technology. So let's see if there's a lesson or two we can't draw from that. What is it that's happening in the rest of our lives that might be, in fact, a message, a precursor for how life could be in a switched-on city in the 21st century? The kinds of things we're used to is the appification of the world. It is literally true that there's more than a million and a half apps available for your iOS or your Android device. Of course. You don't need that many. Put even a small fraction of those in your devices, your life comes to a crashing halt. So what happens is you hear about the cool ones from your friends, and you load them in, and from that point on, they take care of themselves. They're actually very well behaved. They're self-organizing, they're self-optimizing, they keep track of errors and problems, and they report back to the programming teams what things need to be improved. This is the way it works in a sort of connected digital ecosystem, something that's what, what technologists call asset light, fast, distributed, open, rated, porous, kind of magical about how it acts as an ecosystem. If you ask normal people that aren't trained in design and engineering how this happens, their assumption, of course, is that it happens because of geniuses and gadflies and rocket scientists and mavericks and people fueled up on substances that are actively discouraged in most of our lives, right? <laughs> And in fact, this isn't where it comes from. It comes from ordinary people solving problems, but doing so in a modern, digitally enhanced world. Normal people do this. Let me explain, OK? It'll be helpful. We've all been astonished to see the rise of Airbnb. Conceived only a few years ago, it managed in just eight years to figure out how to orchestrate 2.3 million rooms in inventory each and every day. That means that in just 
eight years, it became bigger than all three of the three largest hotel chains combined. That's amazing. That ability to create scale is really remarkable. And, you know, it's likely that it's useful to some of you, either because you want to go stay in a nice place or because you have a room available in your home, perhaps just vacated by a surly teenager en route to college, that you can turn into an income property. Either way, that's the reason why it matters to individuals like you and to me. But what people never explain well enough is how it actually is built. So I've constructed a way for you to understand that in just a couple minutes. The way in which Airbnb actually works is because of a tech stack. Okay? And again, don't think of this as geniuses thought it up. Think of it as kids raised on Lego building bricks that learned how to do that in real life. So let me illustrate. There are 20 application and data capabilities that allow us to scale up Airbnb and run it every day. There are 16 DevOps capabilities that help the engineers change a little bit of something every day. There are 13 utilities and eight business tools. And every single one of these little building bricks comes from archives these days of tens of thousands of them. And engineers just pick the things that they find useful. So a good question to ask is, what would stop you from creating a shared economy capability like Airbnb later this same day? And the answer to that is pretty much nothing. Let me illustrate that. If we take apart the things that are somewhat proprietary to Airbnb, that is, they would make a claim that they cooked it up themselves, you're going to discover that a small handful of these aren't available to you in a way that you could license very swiftly, very cheaply, and routinely. Okay? So that means seven of the 57 capabilities that make Airbnb actually function are slightly proprietary. And if we had a good tech team trying to work around those seven, it might take, I'm betting, uh, four or five hours. <laughs> and so it's important for you to understand that in the modern digital world, all you got to have is a big idea. And it's routinely easy to construct the infrastructure, the capabilities to get that to happen. And nobody does this yet for cities. What if Chicago did? What if we started to create, like we did the last time our city burned down, a completely new way to do things, a way to do things that was astonishing? Now, throughout history, this is a question that politicians have asked. They usually call it economic development. What things can we do in order to give a better set of opportunities to our citizens? It's a really important and noble question. And mostly they answer it with political programs. And don't get me started on TIF funds, the normal way we sort of have slush funds to do this in the city of Chicago. I want to ask the question a different way. What would happen if we used designers and good engineers, business leaders, artists, and politicians coming together to do some things that are remarkable? There's an analogy we can use from one of our sister cities in Hong Kong. Okay? In Hong Kong, they've done something quite remarkable. And it's an example of this way of thinking about the appification of the world and the processes that matter. With Airbnb, we all learned about shared economies. Same thing with Uber or Lyft. So I've done a little, another piece of analysis for you. I've gathered up the, the actual shared economy innovations that already exist in the world. And these are all multi-billion dollar companies already. Nine of them from California, one from Texas, three from New York, uh, one from the UK, one from, uh, from India, one from China so far, one from Australia, and one all the way from New Zealand. These are billion dollar unicorns that are all part of the shared economy. There's another 30 that are very close to a billion. So ladies and gentlemen, we are going to see the shared economy continue to change the way in which citizens are engaged, in which they find opportunities for their family. And it is actually interesting because politicians like this. Politicians actively encourage applications like Uber or Lyft instead of discouraging them, even though they threaten the base taxi business. Why? Because citizens put themselves in those cars, often citizens that don't have normal college degrees or credentialing, maybe come from a different part of the world, maybe have a different unfamiliar name. These are people whose families get better. A mom 
very busy, but she just finds four hours a day to work as an Uber driver. And also politicians love it because the app software automatically pays the taxes and the citizens know, so do the politicians know, that the business is operating legally and in a way that's easily auditable. So that's why we're going to see the shared economy forever. But there's one tiny little problem. This gig economy, the shared economy, it's kind of terrifying for the average citizen. People don't know how they're ever going to retire. They never get any benefits. They're just looking for the next gig. That idea of getting your gerbil wheel spinning as fast as you can, but never knowing if your life is ever going to be any better, is the exact problem we should solve in the city of Chicago for the 21st century. And again, I ask the question, what happens if you ask the question with artists and engineers and designers instead of politicians and economists working alone? In Hong Kong, the way they've answered it is with this special neighborhood called Police Married Quarters. One of the most beautiful parts of Hong Kong, historically important, has recently been taken over by a consortium of design leaders and business leaders working together with politicians. What you see here is a picture of the Cube, a place where events happen literally every day, staged around creative ideas that are local, often from young people that have no resources, given a chance to work in a maker lab with 3D printing and software tools and all kinds of things to make it easy for them to do their ideas. And those PMQ innovations happen in a place that's gorgeous, along with the presence of designers that find the very best examples of things that young people have created with no resources. Those young people are able to say forever that it has been selected by the Hong Kong Design Center as a leading example of design in Asia. And they're able to have for free retail space where they can show their work for a few months at a time. That's the kind of thing that's done in just one city, one place in the world. Elsewhere, like we see with Skiller and Scafidio, they celebrated the millennium by creating in Lake Zurich in Switzerland this extraordinary experience, a place where the citizens could just go out and stand in the fog and create something that was absolutely breathtakingly beautiful, a temporary structure taken down. Sometimes cities design themselves for healthy living, like you see here, the stairway in Copenhagen. When it was made musical, 57 more people used the stairs than used the escalator, right? You can design a way for people to be engaged and for people to be excited about how we live now. We've been doing that lately in the 606, which itself was inspired by the High Line in New York, which itself was inspired by the park considered to be the very greatest park design of the 21st century, the first great park design of the 21st century, our own Millennium Park, which was one of the greatest times in the history of Chicago when designers, architects, business leaders, and politicians were able to essentially get the Park Service in Chicago to create something stunning. Absolutely beautiful remarkably viable. This park provably creates an additional $1.2 billion in economic lift for the city of Chicago every year. There were plenty of people wringing their hands because it went about $100 million over budget. None of them considered the economic lift that would come when we have something truly great, so newsworthy that many conventions routinely locate in Chicago for the ability to take advantage of that. And then we doubled it down with the Maggie Daly Park. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have a history of using design and innovation in this city in ways that others do not. And what should we do next? How do we build on it? What's the open question we should ask now? The question that I think matters is one that allows us to think about a different form of infrastructure, infrastructure that's focused on opportunities for people that feel left out of the modern world, and healthy living for people that really do want to have a longer, healthier, happier life, not quite so materialist, and much more focused on the ways we live with one another. So here's a gratuitous scaffolding, a guess. I'm no Daniel Burnham. I am not going to try to say this is the answer, but it is a provocation. 
It's specifically designed for the city of Chicago, but I want to warn any political leaders in the room that any other city could steal it, okay? <laughs> so it would be really nice if we took it kind of seriously for a little bit, a few minutes. The first thing I'm saying is it can't be done by economists and politicians acting alone. It has to be done in the way we see Chicago at its best with designers and architects contributing materially to the way we want to live. That's when it gets exciting. So we should create, like Hong Kong showed us, a center for creative industries, for creative efforts in the city of Chicago, a place where people can come with no resources but with ideas about things that they'd like to do and make it easy for them to build the ideas that will actually matter. The next thing that we should do is we should hijack our extraordinary universities and get them to pioneer a new class of nano degree. If a team working on something suddenly needs to know how to price it or how to do the technological development or how to create the infrastructure to support it, they should be able to go to a local university and get the just-in-time learning that they need. By the way, amass enough nano degrees for things that you've done in this pragmatic way, they should give you an actual degree with a certificate suitable for framing, okay? Financiers, 1871, and our great Chicago theaters should routinely create events where people generating new ideas in the city of Chicago can showcase them. Okay, this is the place that birthed this American life, the extraordinary radio program that's built on storytelling. This is a place that celebrates the moth and all other kinds of storytelling events. We can create stories better than anyone about the way we'd like to live now and showcase that. Our great philanthropies, MacArthur Foundation, Chicago Community Trust, and the others that are so switched on in this region, some of the best philanthropies in the world should pitch in to try to take the lead in amplifying opportunities and bringing it to all the different neighborhoods in the city of Chicago, especially those that are typically left out of these revolutions to give people a chance to make lives better for themselves and for their families and developers should pile on by creating a new generation of affordable housing designed in ways that are cool, designed for healthy living and often financed and built in the way that Habitat for Humanity has shown us so that the homeowners themselves are part of the solution. They build their homes along with their neighbors and they know how to take care of them. Finally, our extraordinary healthcare organization should take a lead in creating healthier ways to live, ways for all of us to be active, to be engaged, and to have a way to take advantage routinely of the city that we live in that is so livable and can be made even more so. Look, here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. We already have roads and parks, sewers and infrastructure, thanks to Daniel Burnham and the extraordinary construction that we've done over the last 120 years. What are we going to do for the next 100 years? My contention is we have to do it around the lives of our citizens to create an opportunity culture that goes way beyond the gig economy and gives people a chance to figure out how to use their own inventiveness, their own creativity, reduce the friction for doing badass, really cool things, but to do it routinely. 57 years ago, George Bernard Shaw wrote that God may have made this world. That's no excuse for us not to make it better. What say we do? Thank you.